Welcome to Asset Horizon, the live stream here, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, early in the morning on a Thursday. Everybody's up to talk Deleuze and Jung, the Young deleuze connection with Grant Maxwell. We have Adam in the studio. We also have some friends from Twitter online, including Kike Autry, host of the Psyche podcast, and our friend Keanu Clark, who is at MIT and is involved in the in the very sort of niche Twitter space where we talk about the ideas of Deleuze, Hillman, and everyone else that we talk about. Um, as I said, we have Grant back. We had him on a few months ago, or maybe it was almost a year ago now. I can't even remember to talk. Uh, uh, maybe you remember the episode, The Dialectic of the Gods, where we looked at Grant's book, Integration and Difference. We talked about Schelling, Deleuze, Jung, Hillman, Hegel, and some others. And today we wanted to kind of constrain the focus somewhat to Deleuze and Jung. Inevitably, we're going to talk about Hillman and probably going to bring in Schelling and Hegel and do all the stuff that we ordinarily do on the podcast. Uh, but what we wanted to look at is uh, specifically, what are some of the concepts in Deleuze's work that were influenced by Jung? Um, one of the things that Grant argues, which I think is fascinating, is that there's a, a latent Jungianism that is not manifest um, rhetorically, but certainly underlines a lot of what Jung is doing, especially in his early days. And then maybe perhaps later in the discussion, we'll talk about how we can look in a sort of Deleuzean way, or what are the Deleuzean ways in which we can go back to Jung's work and read it and maybe even highlight some of the important things that are still there. Um, also, we have people who are watching us live right now. So if you have questions or comments, perhaps towards the end of the discussion, we'll pull some of those comments in and you can ask any one of us who are here on the podcast today. And we will, we will perhaps put your question, spotlight your question and bring it into the discussion. I'm going to introduce Grant, but first I want to introduce folks who haven't been on with us before. And then the grand finale of introductions will be Grant. First, I want to introduce Kike Autry. I was on his podcast, The Psyche Podcast. Uh, Kike, would you just give a brief introduction of yourself and maybe say one or two things as to why this work is important for you or stands out to you? Sure, yeah. I, I think I am really interested in all this because I'm a practicing psychotherapist uh, working with uh, men and masculinity kind of issues. I also do a lot of stuff with autism spectrum disorder and yeah, I end up bringing Jung and Deleuze and Hillman into kind of the work that I do with people. And yeah, I, th I think that's why I'm here and, and why I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. Excellent. And we also have Keanu Clark, who told me he's at MIT uh, and might be attending Yale, perhaps. We don't know. Uh, Keanu, would you mind giving your own introduction? Yes. So while at MIT, I spent time in the anthropology department where there was a professor who was a student of Donna Haraway, where I got a lot of exposure to the sort of Foucauldian lens of things. Um, and then on the side, I sort of began reading Deleuze on my own and kind of getting into that. And so at some point, I bumped into Hillman by virtue of hanging out with you, you folks. <laughs> and I learned that Jung has sort of a Neoplatonic influence through Karis Gordon to Hillman. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of what's brought me here. It's uh, an interest kind of sort of in Neoplatonism, how those ideas kind of have developed through time, maybe how the Aristotelian notions of life could figure into how biology is done today. I don't know. Things like this. Great. And then, of course, returning guest Grant Maxwell, the author of Integration and Difference, um, whom you may have checked out that episode in the past. If you haven't, certainly do so. Grant, can you give us an introduction? You certainly say what you have worked on in the past, the scope of your research, and maybe talk about some new things that you're working on. Sure. Um, yeah, so my, my, my main work is Integration and Difference, which came out um, about a year ago. And... Um, uh, I did. I did my PhD at the City University of New York's Graduate Center uh, in 2013, and that's actually in English, uh, not in philosophy. But since then, I've I've made the transition into into philosophy. Uh, I I taught for a while at, at in the CUNY system at Baruch College and Lehman College in New York, um, and uh, I've written a few other books and published articles in Deleuze and Guattari studies. Uh, and I'm, I'm writing a book on uh, on the philosophy of Isabel Stengers right now, who is, uh, to me, she's she's one of uh, the most important heirs to Deleuze and Whitehead, um, are her two primary influences. So I'm, I'm sort of about halfway through that book now. 
great. Thank you once again for coming back. And, and I have to say, if you don't have the book Integration and Difference, when we do the final render of this episode, I'll put a link to the book. Definitely get it. I, one of the ways that it's most useful to me is that Grant is so thorough in gathering up all of the men. So for example, it, with, with respect to Deleuze and Jung, he gathers up all the mentions of <laughs> Jung's uh, ideas in Deleuze's work and you know explicates the overlap and it serves as a great concordance for anybody who's interested in doing this kind of work. So definitely pick that up. I'm hoping to begin the discussion with talking about precisely this. Um, so Grant, tell us, uh, like I, I'm assuming that the, the folks who are listening right now might have at least an inkling who Deleuze and Carl Jung are. And we don't have to go in and explain their ideas completely, but perhaps in the course of elaborating the overlap between their ideas, we can talk a little bit about, you know, the sort of primary concepts in their work or the concepts that stand out to you anyway, such as archetypes and individuation and so forth. So with that said, um, let's talk about Jung's influence on Deleuze, especially the early Deleuze. What is it about Jung that captured uh, the, the interest um, for Deleuze and, and how is that expressed in his work? Um, so I, I actually think that this is a bit of a, a rumor that that Jung was more influenced, uh, influential on Deleuze in his early years. Um, that was started by Christian Karslake, who who wrote um, Deleuze and the Unconscious, um, which I think is the first book length work about primarily Jung and Deleuze in 2004. Although it's also about um, Bergson and Kant. Um, but basically, he says he he makes a pretty radical distinction between um, Deleuze's pre '70s work because you know he he started writing um, with Guattari in 1972, or they published Anti Oedipus in 1972, um, and so so he makes this this sort of pretty radical distinction between between those two eras, and I think it's it's much more continuous than he implies. Um, so. I think I think Deleuze's first um, first discussion of Jung is in 1961 um, in that the essay from Sakar Masak to Masochism. He he you know positively discusses Jung in um, Nietzsche and philosophy in 1962, um, and then in 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 Proust and Science he uses the word archetype. I think that's the only time he uses the word archetype in his work. Um, and in, in uh, also in, in the logic of sense from 69, he uses the term synchronicity. And I think that's the singular usage of that term. Um, and 68, I think, is probably his most his most Jungian work. And there's that great um, footnote where he he finds a, a, a profound resonance between um, the, the work of difference and repetition and and the Jungian conception of the unconscious. But. Deleuze said that that he sees difference in repetition as the the seed and the beginning of everything that he did after, both with and without Guattari. Um, and as late as 1988, in the Labasadere interview with um, his student and collaborator Claire Parnett, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, she uh, he he says that there's this this text that he adores by Jung. Um, about well, it's, it's about his relation to Freud and the ossuary of bones and the descent into the the unconscious. So, um, I, I think that that the distinction is maybe could could maybe be be put more that Deleuze, by himself and with Guattari, is they're more positive about Jung, and then Guattari by himself is a little bit more critical of Jung. Or I'd say I'd say Guattari is equally critical of Freud, Jung, and Lacan in his solo work. But in, for instance, in A Thousand Plateaus, um, De, which Deleuze and Guattari wrote together, they say that uh, um, Jung is in in any event profounder than Freud. And you know, um, Derrida even makes a joke about this, and I think a 2004 lecture where he's saying that that Deleuze is unique in in his admiration for Jung over Freud, which which isn't exactly true because also, you know, in, in French philosophy, because you know, Simondon and Bergson um, expressed his admiration for Jung, uh, Bachelard um, was influenced by Jung, so. 
you know, it's it's just it's really interesting that that it's very clear in in Deleuze's works. I, he he either he he praises Jung a number of times. He he uses his concepts. Sometimes he critiques him, um, especially in relation to the archetypes, which I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, but this this influence of Jung on Deleuze hasn't been discussed very much by by Deleuze scholars, and I think there's you know some very interesting um, reasons for that that we could get into. Sure, you know, uh, just in you talking there, it, the mention from Deleuze and Guattari's anti Oedipus comes to mind where they talk about this concept of the body without organs, you know, which to uninitiated readers of Deleuze and Guattari can seem pretty esoteric, but it actually function, this concept functions as um, the, at least in the concept of the, the body without organs uh, of capitalism, functions as the organizing principle of all desire and all economic, socioeconomic behavior. And one of the lines that Deleuze and Guattari put into that book, I believe it's in chapter three, they say that on this body without organs, like on the very fundamental sort of metaphysical surface uh, that under, you know, by which, you know, all socioeconomic production is tethered to, it, it, it's populated with races, with nationalities and with archetypes. And I, I remember seeing that word there for the first time thinking like, oh, this is interesting. There's a kind of convergence between the work of Deleuze and Guattari and Jung here. And that was my first like big notice, I would say. With that said, we don't have to go to that example specifically, but what is an archetype? And, and how is Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari perhaps pulling this in? Maybe how are they cr critiquing it? How are they transforming it? Um, you can speak to any of those questions you'd like. Um, so I think they tend to, when they discuss the archetypes, they tend to be responding to um, Jung's middle period, the conception of the archetypes in his middle period. And I think as Richard Tarnas especially shows, um, the, Jung's conception of the archetypes um, developed significantly over his very long career. So I think he, when he started thinking about the archetypes, um, he says that he he discovered them empirically that, um, as, you know, in his work with patients, um, as, as images found in, in dreams or active imagination. Um, and so, so he tended to think of them as, as organizing categories of the mind as sort of these, these modern inflections of, um, platonic forms, but that were, you know, I think in, in his earlier writings about them, he was he was thinking them is uh, still in a more Kantian way. So he was thinking that that the these these organizing principles were were enclosed within the mind. And as he thought over decades, I think he became more you know, sophisticated, philosophically sophisticated, and he began to see that 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 their potencies or dynamisms that permeate process across scale. And I think that he also, um, he made a movement away from looking at the archetypes as transcendent forms that are these, well, I don't, I don't really think that he ever asserted that they were like a static given um, model in the sense of the platonic forms. I mean, one of, one of his interesting quotes, I think it's from, I think it's from archetypes in, in the collective unconscious, but I'm not sure about that. But he says that, that again and again, again, he encounters the mistaken notion that archetypes are determined in regard to their content. And he says this, this is, and so this, I think this is so often the caricature uh, that's, that's, you know, imposed on the archetypes by people who haven't really read Jung. Um, and what he says that they're, that they're closer to the axial system of a crystal. There are sort of potentialities and constraints for, for becoming. Um, and, he, and I think by Mysterium Cognitionis, his, his last full length monograph written, you know, was published in, in his 80s, um, he's, he's taking a more um, transcendental 
view of the archetypes rather than a transcendent view. And we could talk about that if you'd like. Um, but to get back to your question, which is, oh, right. So, so <laughs> well, see, now I want to talk about the transcendental. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, how, how are Deleuze and Guattari pulling on that? I know in A Thousand Plateaus, right. in the plateau on becoming animal, for example, um, it becomes the sort of bounding off point for a critique of a certain reading of the archetypes and perhaps the way that archetypes are understood by Jung in the early and middle period. Um, and as we get to the later period and also with the revelation of Jung's The Red Book, we, we can see that there is a way that Jung understood and actually utilized images that seems to belie some of the, the, the misconceptions about archetypes being these sort of reified categories of intelligibility, the, the more Kantian thing that you were talking about. But, um, you know, maybe that's one place we can start. Like how, how are Deleuze and Guattari reading archetypes or what are their opinions of it? Right. So, yeah. So I think they, 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 I think it's in, in a thousand plateaus. They're saying that, that, um, the archetypes are, are re-territorializations that they're, there's, it's, it's, um, and so they, they want to push, beyond this conception of the archetypes. And I, you know, I think they're reading, they're, they're focusing primarily on that middle period and reading Jung a little too narrowly, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, they, you know, Delius says that they're not even, they're, they're not even after coherence in their own work. So, so <laughs> they can't really expect it of, of Jung at the same time. And we were, we were talking about the um, body without organs earlier and, and Delius in a, in an interview at one point says that they never even understood that concept in the same way at Deleuze and Guattari. So it's, you know, I think what they're doing is they're, um, they're pushing concepts to their limit and trying to create new concepts and, and, and um, new forms of language to, to generate new ideas. Um, and so, so, you know, I think people can, can get caught up in the, in the, the minutia of, well, they, you know, they misunderstood, they misunderstood Jung, or maybe they hadn't read those, that, those later te texts or something like that. But I think, you know, what they ultimately did, especially I think in Difference and Repetition, what Deleuze did, is he provides a more philosophically sophisticated um, language for understanding um, these Jungian concepts of the archetypes and synchronicity too. I think, I mean, I, I mean, we can get into this, but I think that um, the concept of synchronicity and the concept of repetition are very closely related. If, if I mean, they're, they're almost diff different valences of the same, the same idea. I mean, if you look at the way they describe these two concepts, they're describing the same thing. Um, and he, even in Guattari, even though he's he's sort of critical, as critical of Jung, I don't think he's more critical of Jung than he is of Freud or Lacan in his solo work. But there are passages, like I'm reading uh, Chaosmosis right now, and there's this one passage that it, it's a description of synchronicity. And, <laughs> you know, it's and so... Um, so it's, it's sort of like, you know, and I think the reason for that might have something to do with the bias against Jung in academia. And I think a lot of that has to do with Jung's interest in occult phenomena, um, which was at the root of his break with Freud. And Freud went on an extended campaign, of course, to, you know, to discredit Jung. And, and you know, Freud had these rationalist you know, presuppositions, rationalist and materialist presuppositions. Um, and, and Jung was becoming very interested in in you know in alchemy and 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 animism and thaumaturgy and, and things of this nature. Yeah, it's funny because there's a way in which that Jung's break with Freud somewhat mirrors Guattari's break with Freud and, and even the way or, or with Lacan rather, and even the way that Lacan kind of tried to broker a deal with Deleuze. Like there's this sort of history of betrayals that we can track, you know, in this lineage of thought. But I wanted to open up the conversation a bit. I, Kike, I know you had a question about archetypes. And of course, Adam and Keanu, I, I want to leave room for you to make questions or comments. So maybe we'll start with Kike if you, if you do. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so I, I wanted to make just a little comment and then ask kind of a question that kind of builds on the archetypes. I would say, because I do spend a lot of time with Freudians, 
and they're always reminding people that there's kind of different Freuds. You have to think about like pre and then post death drive. And I would just say to be charitable, Jung, like like I think Grant has pointed out, we have to understand there's an evolution of Jung and, you know, he, he kind of developed his thought and to just kind of stereotype him or reduce him to kind of a simplistic notion of the archetypes, I don't think is always fair. So that's that's kind of the comment. Um, I guess the question kind of building on actually something you quoted, uh, Grant, earlier this week on Twitter, you said this is from Jung, the primary activity of psychic life is the creation of fantasy. And I kind of wanted to see what you think Jung meant by that and then how that might connect to Deleuze and Guattari in any way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, Hillman, who... who and is, Hillman, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think what he's, what he's saying is that, is that every mode of thought, every... every so, so I think this is ultimately a constructivist way of conceiving our relation to experience. And I think, I think that, that con constructivism is very closely related to, to an archetypal mode of thought and also to pragmatism. So it's the idea that that reality is potentialities and constraints. It's and that we have to always negotiate with that. That there's not a given transcendent reality behind appearances that we can discover the ultimate truth of, um, which I think is has been a dominant, um, you know, a dominant mode of thought since Plato, and which um, you know Nietzsche really, really I think kicked off the <laughs> the the. The rejection of that idea, and then Deleuze goes on to say um, that that modern the task of modern philosophy is the overturning of Platonism, but through resources from Plato himself and retaining a lot of what's great in Plato, um, that it's it's the overturning of that conception that there's a transcendent, um, static, eternal grounding behind appearances. Um, and I forgot what your question was. I, I going off about Plato there. Oh, just, yeah, no, you kind of answered the first part, which is what he uh, meant by that. And then how that might connect to Deleuze and Guattari, which you've kind of addressed. So right, I think okay. you've answered it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Keanu, you're up next. Yeah. So you've been working with Stengers recently. And I'm very curious if the work that Deleuze and Guattari kind of do in adjacent to like chaos theory and the fractal stuff, if that kind of figures into the maybe way that they play with Jungian concepts, if you see any kind of connection there. Uh, between between chaos theory and fractals and and archetypes yeah do you do you think there's anything there it's fine it's uh, not. I'm just curious I, I, absolutely yeah i mean uh, you know delus and guattari talk about fractals in what is philosophy um guattari talks about fractals um quite a bit i think it was in schizoanalytic cartographies mm -hmm. um and yeah i mean i think i think what you know what fractals are is there they're these geometrical geometric entities that are um they they go through iterations and they're sort of they're I, I, you can think of them almost as like a seed for becoming mm -hmm. um they're they're attractors yeah. and they can, they can become in a lot of different ways and that, you know so i think guattari talks about the strange attractor in um in uh, i think in schizoanalytic cartographies so um, are archetypes kind of like attractors of sorts or would you say there's something different I think that's a that's a really generative way to think about them. I mean, so I think you know I, I remember what I was trying to get at with, with Kike's question, which is re re related to this, is the idea that that can, that there's no fixed reality, but rather that there are these um, potentialities and constraints, which I think can be thought of in fractal terms. Um, and and you know when people think of fractals, they often think of the Mandelbrot set and sort of this like you know yeah. like kind of psychedelic. Um, which is great, you know. I, I, I love that stuff. But it's sort of, sort of just the images of of on YouTube or something. What you know, just smoking weed and watching the, the Mandelbrot set, which is fine. I'm sure we've all done that. But <laughs> um, but uh, you know, what what it comes down to is that these are these the Mandelbrot, you know, invented a, a novel geometry that was that was already there. Um, or the elements of it were there and he brought it out right at the same time that Deleuze and Guattari were doing their work in the 60s and 70s. So there are just a lot of resonances um, I think between between their work. And um, so 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 you know the idea of 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 that that, that the 
the function of of reality is is or the, I'm sorry, the function of the mind is the creation of of fantasy. Mm -hmm. That any mode any mode of relation to experience is ultimately a narrative mm -hmm. construction yeah. from malleable potentialities and constraints. So so I think that that's what Jung means. That that it's primarily imaginal because even a even a, a re, you know a reductive rationalist or materialist mode of thought um, is still that's a narrative construction that that defines itself through the disqualification of modes of thought that have been predominant for most of, of human history and th and that that you know sort of rationalist materialist mode was kind of um, extracted from from these non-modern modes of thought. And so I think that's, you mentioned Stangers, I think that's what she's so great yeah. about is showing showing how, how these um, science is um, one extremely valid and generative and productive mode of construction, but it's one mode, narrative mode of construction among among others that are all generative in very different ways. The, so everything you've said has touched upon my point very well. I, thank you for the answer. Um, my response that I kind of thought of during that or kind of the comment that I that came to mind was that I've been questioning like how one could build a narrative by like tr progressing through a manifold or like going to different kind of zones or, you know, we could say deterritorializations or reterritorializations, right? Being attracted may be different parts of some kind of phase space, you know, like honing in attractors and just a subset of the geometry. And if somehow this could maybe create narratives and experiences and things, um, one can maybe bring in like Lacan's like quilting point or something, or like Bergson's notion of several like phases of time being stitched together. Um, I don't know. I This is something I'm curious about and want to like try to like formalize and get down more. So these ideas might be too up in the air for you to be able to say anything to them. But if you think there's anything generative there for you, please respond. Definitely. I mean, this is, this is I think, right down the center of what we're talking about, actually. Um, in difference and repetition, the, the word multiplicity, well, it's, um, they use it, you know, in a lot of different texts, but that word is multiplicité, which is mm -hmm. the word for manifold in French, uh, Riemannian manifold. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we're talking about, it's not just, multiplicity isn't just, isn't just the many, it's um, it's topological yeah. relationality with no fixed central proposition. The thing is, earlier you guys asked me before the stream started, how does biology and computer science play into any of the stuff that I read? And I think that actually um, today in molecular biology, there's the discussion of like topologically associated domains, where there are sections of chromosomes where they have like these blockages that make sure that things interact just in like a bubble. And if you break that, everything goes haywire. Like this notion of topology, this notion of things interacting, it seems to be very, very present in that field today. And whenever I read Deleuze and Guattari, I get this feeling that like the same math is happening. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, indifference in and repetition. I mean, what's what's so interesting? I mean, that's a, it's just it's just such a generative great book. But um, so what what we're talking about repetition is is we're talking about this extraction of of rationality from non-modern modes of thought um, is an extraction of linear static temporality of the a linear conception of Newtonian absolute time, and so prior to this this linear conception of time, this linear construction of time, um, non-modern cultures tend to think of time in a cyclical way as a as a closed circulation in terms of the cycles of nature. Um, in terms of in terms of the seasons and um, you know death and decay and, and rebirth and maturation, um, and also in terms of the astronomical cycles, uh, and and so what I think you know I think Delu says this somewhere that that linear temporality was was an opening of that closed circulation um, at two ends at the beginning and the end. Um, it was a it was an opening of that, but it was also a, a reduction of it in some ways. Yeah. So I, I think what De Deleuze does in in which is extremely similar to what Jung does with synchronicity, it's 
it's a it's a decentered circulation. So if you think of if you think of so synchronicity is and repetition. It's this is a description of both of these terms. It's the idea that if you're looking at events on a linear timeline, that two moments. This is diachronic synchronicity. There's there's yeah. also synchronic synchronicity. That two events on a linear timeline can resonate with one another. So you can think of it as a string that's folded back upon itself. Yeah. In, yeah. And well, in a more expanse in a more expansive manifold. Mm -hmm. That that temporality isn't just a, a unidimensional, a, a unidimensional um, trajectory. That it's mm -hmm. a that it's situated in a, in a you know, more topologically expansive manifold, describable through um, number, and and that so and you know Deleuze's point is that each iteration of of the repetition of these they're, they're transcendental dynamisms, they're potencies that are they're they're situated at a at a at a transcendental horizon. And they're always receding as as we approach them, and there are complexes of these 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 you know archetypal dynamisms, mm -hmm. um, potentialities for for becoming that can manifest in, in in infinite ways, but they're constrained to particular axes of signification. Yeah. Um, and so so you repeat you you go through these these. These, these this decentered circulation and so you know this goes this goes back to Sp Spinoza but what basically what Deleuze says is that our task and this is the eternal return you know and, and and Nietzsche never really he never really offered a positive articulation of the eternal return he, he sort of more um, cleared space for it by by destroying what it would supplant but but what what he says our task is is to choose the higher register of these repetitions um, by you know the introduction of uh, through difference by by enacting difference through the introduction of novelty into actuality and this is exactly what what Jungian synchronicity is it's um, I'm, you know I, I could go on and on but I want to open up the discussion. There are two two forms of synchronicity. There's the there's the synchronic and diachronic. But uh, I'm I'm going to stop now. Great. Yes, we're we're in a very profound place right now, and we <laughs> we have a lot of threads going on. But Adam, I, I'm sure you have something by now. Go for it. Yes, I mean, I want Grant. I'd like to ask you to uh, <laughs> ask the question you were sort of, uh, sort of trying to hold yourself back from earlier, which is the transcendental which is probably in a whole new kettle of fish, but it's definitely lurking underneath everything we're talking about here in a way that the transcendental does, which is the <coughs> transcendental, or, you know, at least in Kantian terms, always relates to the imminent presuppositions of our experience. And so I, I had a question about the transcendental in Jung generally versus in Deleuze, but also particularly around the question of another concept of Jung's, which is sort of hangover and discussion or sort of the, the standard things we think about when we hear the word Jung is the collective unconscious. Can we read, well, is, is there a sort of a viability to reading the collective unconscious in this manner as a transcendental, as the collective presuppositions of our collective, like the ways in which we, we as humans generally, or not so universally, but generally, you know, structure our experience of ourselves in ways in which we may not even be fully aware. I mean, for Kant, we, we're not aware of the presuppositions of our experience until he writes the book that tells us what they are. And in relation to Deleuze, and especially to Deleuze and Guattari, I'd like to ask if, if this notion of the collective unconscious is at all isomorphic or translatable to how they think about, you know, the materialist unconscious, the societal unconscious, the idea that Sort of, yeah, we well, we are not. There are presupp material presuppositions uh, which structure the entire way in which we experience the world around us. Ec you know, entire transcendental economies, transcendental habits, and I wonder how these ideas map onto a transcendental reading of Carl Jung. Um, so, so I think you know, Deleuze says that his reading of Kant is, is Kant is sort of an enemy. For, for Deleuze, and he's he's saying that in the context of 
of you know of, of Hegel saying saying how Hegel is a special enemy and and Kant is sort of sort of um, also somebody that he critiques strongly but he sort of extracts this concept of the tr the transcendental which I, I mean I think a, a good way to envisage it is that um, there, that it's not that these potentialities, these potencies, these dynamisms, these archetypes are in a transcendent domain that's a completely other world to this imminent mm -hmm. world that we inhabit, that, but rather that there's only one world, there's only one imminent world, and that, that these potencies, which can only be described metaphorically and through and imaginally, um, they, they reside at a, at, an, at a transcendental horizon that always recedes as we approach it. So, the, so they, they, they lure us. Um, so, so transcendence is the overcoming of present givenness. It's, it's pushing back the horizon of discernibility. It's not entrance into a radically other world. Um, and so, and I think I think Jung understood this, especially in Mysterium Conjunctionis. I think um, he uses the word transcendental in that book. I mean, he's he's inconsistent even in that even in that book, but he uses the word transcendental in that s specific sense. Mm. Um, so and so yeah, and yes, I do think that the the conception of the the collective unconscious is that these these you know, dynamic potencies, which are expressed in, you know, in, in, in mythology and in, in, in literature and in cinema. Um, <laughs> I like that comment. Um, uh, that, that these are, that these are the, the, they're narrative constructions of the potentialities that inform reality across scales and orders. So, so, um, you know, on a, in terms of the, the, the movements of materiality, um, you know, you can look at like elemental qualities that are associated with different archetypes, uh, you know, fire, water, etc. cetera. Um, you know, but they, and they express themselves psychologically, they express themselves relationally, sociologically, economically. Um, and so, and I think that's one thing, um, you know, I, I've been talking about that with both Craig and Kike fair amount that um you know that that um that <laughs> that, that uh what what are we talking what are we talk okay so we're talking about uh the economic um i had a point that i was going to make and it's just gone out of my head so someone say something <laughs> it hit the transcendental horizon yes it did i, I flew away <laughs> Well, perhaps on this point, I became you know, numinal. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> um, one of the things that I often think about with respect to Jung and, you know, a, a sort of shared <clears throat> or perhaps general antipathy that some scholars have towards Jung's work is that he is an irrationalist. Um, and this is something that we kind of brushed by earlier. And there is a way in which <clears throat> perhaps Deleuze's work through the lens, or at least through the legacy of Nietzsche, is also understood somewhat in the same way. But there are very important concepts pegged to this epithet. Uh, for Jung, it might be the concept of synchronicity. Uh, for, <clears throat> for Deleuze, it could be this concept of transcendental empiricism. But this is the one area where I think Jung and Deleuze strongly overlap is because these concepts of synchronicity and trans transcendental empiricism uh, involve this notion of an a causal relationship between events in the world. And I remember, you know, for, for those of us who like, like me, I was in a, an MA program that was strongly bent towards analytical philosophy. Um, the idea of, of causal logic inhabits common sense and so forth. And, and thus the, the charge of irrationality is issued forth from anyone who sort of occupies that position in the discipline. I, I'm just wondering, how is this logic of synchronicity articulated in Jung? What's the justification for it? And 
does it de indeed pair with or is it parallel to this notion of transcendental empiricism? And I think f for me, too, and maybe this is something maybe we can like move away from the philosophical a little bit into the actual psychological dimension of of both Jung and Deleuze's work. How do these things sort of cash out psychologically or even ethically? Um, I, I hope something there like you can grab onto. Um, okay, so I, re I just remembered what I was going to say. And oh, it, go for I think, it. Go I think it. it's related to what you're, I think it's also related to what you're saying. Um, sure. But, uh, you know, on a, on a social order, you know, we, we talk a lot about capitalism and, and I think, you know, the figure of Kronos, um, the Saturnine Senex figure um, is one, one archetypal potency that that Deleuze and Guattari um, talk about as well, and I think they it, they they talk about it in Kafka, um, and it's 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 this this you know labyrinthine um, you know Kafka esque um, it's uh, um, c you know controlling um, the spirit of gravity. It's 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 death, and it's this the. the um, the societies of it's the societies of control that Deleuze talks about in the essay, and so and so I think that that's that's one potency among many, and it's also it's also the the god of monotheism. It's the 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 this, the it's the father god. It's the, the the singular. So I think so I think this figure of Kronos organizes um, all of these qualities um, in a in a really useful way, and it's and it's sort of like well. It, is there is there really this god out there or this titan out there named Kronos, some living in some transcendent domain? And so I think, you know, the the the, the most generative approach to this is one that was initiated by Schelling in the, um, you know, what, what is it? the lecture is the the hist historical critical introduction to the philosophy of mythology, where he's basically talking about how. I mean, it's a very startling thing for 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 the for you know Hegel's roommate to say um, late in his career that 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 the gods of polytheism are real, but their reality is ontologically ambiguous. And so 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 I think that's true of of the archetypes as well. That that it's. And, and I think that's why Deleuze calls it a transcendental empiricism, is that it's 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 not that that there are these um, you know transcendent archetypal forms um, that the imminent world is is sort of um, you know a, a, an attenuated degeneration of, um, but but rather um, that they're discerned empirically in reality, and that reality itself on all scales in terms of our you know our relational experience, or in terms of uh, in terms of our experience of nature, um, it it naturally organizes itself into these these sort of axes of signification, which can be described, you know, as as I I mean Deleuze reappropriates um, the the word ideas and difference and repetition to mean this more transcendental conception um, in in uh, a thousand plateaus um, Deleuze and Guattari use the, the the word cosmic forces um, and I, I think that I think so I think you know there's just so many different ways you know multiplicities phantasms simulacra um, quasi causes and and in terms of the the conception of causation um, synchronicity as as Jung in this in the subtitle of synchronicity says it's it's an acausal connecting principle. But what I think he really means by that is that it's not because when in in modernity when we think of causation we generally think of efficient causation. There are the four kinds of Aristotelian causation: um, efficient, which is basically I mean I, I'm telling you guys what you already know, but um, it's just material things bumping into other material things um, generally. But then there are also there are these two other kinds of causation: formal causation and final causation. And I think all of these figures we're talking about have served to deepen and to, to offer sort of more subtle and profound conceptions of these two modes of causation. And so that's what synchronicity is. It's it's a it's a a, a reimagining of formal and final causation. Um, 
you know, I think descended from you know, Spinoza and, and Leibniz and Schelling and Nietzsche. Um, and, and, and I think Deleuze is doing the same thing. I, you know, it's, but ultimately what it comes down to is this, I think this is something, just to wrap up, this is something that, that Deleuze, I think, took from Bergson, which is, is that these, these modes of causation, they're not, even these modes of causation aren't waiting to be discovered in a transcendent domain. Their, their mode, their modes of relational description that can be can be elicited from from a, an ungrounded, rela ultimately relational reality, um, and they're they're really useful, you know, but they also have have limitations, and so that's I think that's why these all of these thinkers are constantly, you know returning, eternally returning to these concepts over and over again and, and expressing them in new language and, and trying to look at them from, a, they're teasing out nuances and they're trying to constructively elicit, you know, new concepts from the, you know, collisions of these, these existing concepts. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that's what we're doing is we're trying to carry this, this project forward by, by trying to draw out, for instance, the relation of Jung and Deleuze that hasn't really been explored very much, even though there's a lot there to explore. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, just a couple things on that. Um, amidst your description of, you know, the a causal nature of synchronicity, uh, we had just finished reading A Thousand Plateaus and we did the conclusion. And there's something about the way that you described it there, which makes me think that even the concept of synchronicity attends to their, their idea of what they call an abstract machine. Right. There, there's a way in which, you know, we can view relationships and the relata in reality as having this sort of multiplicity of connectivity and conjunctions, you know, such that, you know, a notice of one particular phenomenon against something seemingly completely unrelated can elicit this whole range of other notices. And I, I think there, there's definitely something to unpack there. I, I know I want to get Kike in the discussion uh, because I think he has to bow out early. Um, before you do bow out, Kike, was there any other questions that you had? Yeah, just <clears throat> from a psychotherapeutic perspective, I was I was wondering, um, Grant, if you could speak to the shadow. You know, in Jung, the shadow is this kind of dimension in us that's not integrated into our conscious personality. I, I was just wondering if you see any overlap in like Deleuze and Guattari's work. Like, do, do they get into this notion of the shadow or is there any concept that they unpack that might be connected to that? Okay, so, yeah. So the, the first thing that occurs to me is in um, Deleuze's book on Francis Bacon, he says the confrontation with the shadow is, is the only real problem or something to that effect. Um, you know, it's, I think it's really interesting because so much of what Deleuze does, especially in difference and repetition to me is, is sort of, um, he's, you know, this is my, like, kind of my one critique of Deleuze is his, his reading of Hegel. And the, I actually, I think he's right about Hegel, but I think he goes a little too far. And I think what he's, what he's trying to do is, is somehow avoid avoid the negative and that the negative is the shadow. Um, and so, you know, I think he's, he's Deleuze is, is affirming um, every archetypal potency. I mean, he, you know, Deleuze uses, uses the figures of polytheism all the time. He mentions so many different mythological figures. Um, but, but I think, you know, in his, his ultimately, you know, profound and sophisticated way, indifference and repetition. He's he's some, trying to escape the negative by negating the negative, and so it's this this complex paradoxical um, operation. And um, you know, I think I think ultimately, um, what he's getting at is is expanding. From a, from the oppositional mode of thought, which is reconciled by a third thing into a, you know more topologically complex and pluralist multiplicity. 
Um, but the issue of, of the shadow, I think, you know, really gets us into issues of, of projection and, and, um, you know, that's, that's really central to the process of, of individuation because, because, you know, as Jung says, it's, it's so important. Projection is, is necessary. That's how we, that's how we forge ourselves against a projected other, which is, um, Sean Kelly, who, who's, who wrote a book, um, about, and it's called, um, it's about Jung and Hegel and it's, it's, uh, Individuation in the absolute. He talks a lot about about this subject, um, which is basically that the process of individuation through projection of our shadow and and our anima or animus on the other is a, a dialectical process um, where we're we're forging ourselves against a projected other. Um, but then, you know, what's so interesting is that um, Deleuze like Jung is, is, is articulating a, an exceeding of this oppositional formulation um, to look at a more expansive mythical dialectic, which is, which is the eternal return. It's, it's integrating myth into the dialectic is what he says in Difference and Repetition. So, so it's, you know, we, we all contain all of these archetypal potencies within us and Often, what's most vigorously repressed, we encounter, we encounter it in in the other, um, and so so that you know is that gets into the you know the demonization of other cultures, other races, other you know other sexualities, other genders, um, and and that's a that's um, a projection of, of of that shadow onto the other, and so our task is to integrate integrate that shadow. But I think you know, and I think Jung has been legitimately critiqued for sort of emphasizing this 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 return to wholeness and oneness that 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 Deleuze critiqued Hegel for. And I, I think Jung is kind of ambivalent about this, and he is, you know, says a lot of different things about this in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think, you know, it's what Hillman is really draws out of of Jung, and and it's so resonant with what Deleuze and Guattari do, is that we, you know, you move past this oppositional relation with the other, not to a reconciled identity with the other, where you attain perfect peace and oneness and wholeness with yourself and with the world, because that's obviously not ever going to happen. But what you, what you do is you expand the relational, imaginal milieu into a more um, expansive, pluralist multiplicity of dynamisms. And, you know, I mean, that's expressible in a group like this. There are five of us here and, you know, we're all maybe expressing different potencies at different times and it's constantly shifting and, and there's, you know, so it's, um, it's just, a, I think it's just a much more generative way to think about it. That, that's what I, I mean by a mythical dialectic. It's, it's, it's a dramatization. It's, it's a dramatization of problems and questions, which are the motive factors of being, um, but not, you know, so, so, so opposition is one valid mode of narrative construction, but it's not the privileged one as has been, you know, it's, it's even, I think even more egregiously in like an analytic philosophy, which I think there's some good analytic work, but it's truth, you know, philosophy is constructed as the oppositional um, battle between rival claimants and the victorious one, you know, proves their truth if they're, you know, with their their superior argument, and the the one who loses the debate, you know, embodies falsehood. And and so that I think what all of these thinkers are doing is trying to exceed that oppositional um, relation construction. Great. Um I think we have Keanu next in the queue, if you have anything, Keanu. Yeah, I want to try and make the notion of potencies very, very concrete in the Lincoln and episodic memory. So I'm going to propose a scenario, and I'd like you to correct it if you think it's wrong in elucidating this concept. 
but let's say that there are two fridges, one at my place and one at my friend's place. Let's say there are different things in these fridges and that means that I can make different foods, that there are different potential flavor potencies that are embedded in the combinations thereof that I could put together. Um, would you think that's kind of like a, a scenario that we can play with the concept of potency and that's coherent or do you think there's a problem somewhere with that? Um, I, I think it's Guattari who talks about taste and right. you know it's aesthetics it's so is so important in in understanding and in envisaging these potencies I mean you know as the 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 headline says here potency is you know it comes from the potens in Latin and that's you know translates as power potential in potentia mm -hmm. um, and so and so you know I I mean, I think, for instance, I think that's what um, Nietzsche was getting at with with the will to power. Mm -hmm. Is not it's not just the assertion of power over another. It's it's the will to follow these these dynamic potencies mm -hmm. to their to their limit and mm -hmm. to and as I think as you're suggesting with this 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 analogy of the you know different foods and. You know, combining them. I mean, that's what I think. That's what cooking is. I, you know, I love to cook, and and I think, you know, you're taking these, you know, the sh the, the whatever the, you know, the sharp, uh, you know, lemon, and combining it with the, the, you know, the, the f fiery garlic or something like that, and and creating, you know, creating these, um, these, um, you know, assemblages, um, where something novel emerges, but it's not, you know. There's still distinct flavors in these in these dishes, so I think that's that's a really good image for what we're talking about. Awesome. I hope that clarified the people's questions in the comments about like what are they talking about potencies. Oh, awesome! Thanks, Keanu. Uh, Adam, you're up next. I'm still thinking about this idea of potency, but also aligned in in terms of particularly going back to the idea of critiquing Deleuzean's sort of very surface critique of, of Hegel as simply trying to negate your way out of negation itself. And particularly thinking about this idea of opposition being its own kind of paradigm. And I think it is incredibly sort of useful to get out of this paradigm because I think that what I think they're restricting about Hegel is the idea that, and it, every Hegelian likes to make this joke. I was one of them, so I know this. Uh, which is that you can never really escape Hegel, but don't don't make they let it fool you. They really believe you cannot escape Hegel, because every difference is retroactively presupposes the unity, which is going to end up later. It's going to end up being unified later, in a way. And this is problematic insofar as Hegel himself cut himself off of any sort of future prediction. And yet this one, this kind of retrospective unity sort of completely gets, you know, gets, gets run out by sort of, a, a sort of people who are sort of all in awe of absolute knowledge, the possibility of absolute knowledge. But when it comes to sort of new models of mythotype myth, myth, myth making, dramatization, I guess one of the things I appreciate so much about integration and difference, particularly, is this move, particularly through someone like Schelling's uh, also his positive philosophy. And I just wanted to ask if you, if you could sort of unpack a bit more that move towards a new kind of positivity. Because one of the things I appreciated as much in our last conversation as well is how you talked about how the the, the anti of anti Oedipus is a attempting a new model of being anti anything because of course the standard dialectical repost would be you've defined yourself as anti this and therefore you're carrying this with you and it, you you will be sublated back into this but with a different sort of flavor want you to expand a little bit on this new way of dating and particularly this idea of the the, the metamorphosis of, of resistance the metamorphosis of saying no right um so, I mean, I, I think that 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 um, you know Heidegger says about Nietzsche that everything that that thinks that is anti to something to something, and sp specifically in the case of Nietzsche, and is anti Christianity, um, and the Antichrist is thinks in the spirit um, 
against which it opposes itself. Um, and so, I, you know, I think I, I think that you can't escape opposition. Oh, my computer just died. Okay, uh, you can't es escape opposition um, as long as you are opposing yourself to opposition. Um, that 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 that's the Hegelian that's the Hegelian trap. And I think, you know, I think that the the attempt to to reject Hegel, it's 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 an expression of the best mode of thought to describe that rejection of Hegel is the Hegelian negative itself. Um, but it's this paradoxical formulation that allows that allows Deleuze after that to say to say um, you know whenever someone puts an objection to me, I say okay, okay, let's go on to something else. Let's it's you exceeding the dialectic, uh, completely rejecting the negative is like rejecting the number two. It's you know, and 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 Jung Jung says this. He says you know, multiplicity starts with with two, and and I think that's true. I think that Hegel is an opening, um, an opening to multiplicity, but but he but his his conception of the absolute is absolutist and it's total, it's totalizing and it's totalitarian to, or, mm. you know when taken to its logical conclusion i mean in in the science of logic he says that the dialectic is the one and only true method so i think i think you know for instance so i think what what you know what Deleuze and Guattari are doing in anti in anti oedipus i mean i i do this whole section in the in the in the book mm. where um you know, in, in their the dual biography um, of, uh, of Deleuze and Guattari by by Das, mm. it's very clear that that Deleuze's relation to his father was Oedipal. Um, his his father was a you know right wing anti semite um, who uh, um, you know left him in tears on various occasions, and he you know Deleuze's brother brother died, and his parents always. Always preferred his brother George, who died fighting the heroically fighting the Nazis, yeah. um, and so I think it's very clear that that you know, and the, Jean Wall says this actually in in his in his review, who's Deleuze's mentor, and Deleuze says that he was the most important um, philosopher other than Sartre in the fifties in France, and and he says this about Deleuze that 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 it. In, in Nietzsche and philosophy, his review of Nietzsche and philosophy, that that there's this sense of resentment toward mm. toward Hegelianism, and so I, I, but I think so. So this is this is really resonant actually with Hillman's idea of the Acorn theory, um, it, and you know which he called that's his his idea from later in his work. But I think his his mm. his work was always getting at this idea that that the things that are problems for us. So in this case. You know, Deleuze's struggle with it's the trauma from his brother's death. He was very close to his brother. He had a distinctly edible relation with his father. And but that's what I think motivated him to express the to engage with this edible problematic at, at, at its highest register to express the self-immolating critique of the edible, of the dominance, the exclusivist dominance of the edible complex in, you know, modern culture, um, hmm. because he experienced particular, particularly experienced this complex himself, um, and so it, so instead of just expressing this complex in a, you know, that's just a typical adolescent rebellion against his father, which he, I mean, he probably did that as well, but um, he, this, it's, it's that struggling with that, like he, he wouldn't have the, the will and the motivation to engage so deeply with, with the Oedipal if it mm. didn't trouble him. So, but I think, I think, you know, the point is that, is that the Oedipal complex is a valid complex. And and I don't think they ever I don't think mm. Deleuze Guattari ever say that the Oedipal complex isn't a valid construction of psychic reality. I think they what what they're saying is that there are all these other um, complexes that are describable in mythological terms um, that are 
equally important and valid. And and you know, Zizek says that that anti Oedipus is the critique of of the Oedipal is directly derived from Jung, and he states this as fact. And you know, I think it's probably true, but um, I think the the evidence isn't quite as as <laughs> as clear as, as Zizek claims. But um, but I think I mean I think that's that's probably true. I think that's probably true that. So it's very resonant with Jung's primary disagreement mm. with Freud about the Oedipal complex and, and the occult, which are sort of bound together. The way in which you've described sort of Deleuze's life relation to his brother here has given me a very inspiring reading of Deleuze's life, actually, which is Deleuze, it's a wonderful life. He, he kind of is this sort of George Bailey figure. His brother dies of Ehrlich fighting the Nazis. He's rejecting all of the, you know, life has dealt him a dull, a dull hand. He's rejecting the familial structures and then trying to totally negate himself out of the opposition he's facing with capital, ultimately. And then, luckily, the cosmic forces, because God doesn't appear in this, God's just a nebula in this movie, come down. They sort of show him what would happen if he if he tried to negate opposition and then simply instead returns back to Earth and then finds a struggle against the, the, the forces of capital preserved in the wider multiplicity of the interconnection of people's lives, achieving a relational analysis of his own singular existence. So Deleuze, it's a wonderful life. It's the most Deleuze in Christmas movie, and this is this is inspired by the the, the post Oedipal reading you've given here, Grant. So, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Returning Christmas to its pagan roots um, is what I say. <laughs> Actually, at this time, I just want to do a plug for for everyone who's doing stuff in, in the in the chat right now. Um, Grant, do you have a copy of your book nearby? I do. <laughs> yeah, why don't you hold it up to the camera? So, sure. like, if you've enjoyed this discussion so far. Definitely grab Integration and Difference. As I said earlier, this book is comprehensive with a capital C insofar as it involves the figure Schelling, Hegel, Deleuze, Hillman, Jung, everyone that we've been talking about here today. And it's something that I'm probably going to go back to as I begin to write a new book on Nietzsche. And, and of course, there's inflections of Nietzsche there too. Also, we have Anti-Oculus, A Philosophy of Escape coming out. And interestingly, there is there are some parallels <laughs> with Grant's work as an abundance of the, the chapter that I worked on deals with the overlap between Jung and Deleuze and also, also Hillman, which kind of brings us to our last or what I'd like maybe to be the last sort of topic or theme here, unless there's any other pressing issues, which is the question of individuation. Because this is a concept, of course, that comes from Carl Jung. Um, I think it would be important to talk about, like, what is individuation? What does individu individuation mean for, for Jung? And we, we kind of brush past it in talking about synchronicity a little bit. But then when we get to Deleuze and then we get to Hillman, Deleuze has this concept of difference in differentiating where he casts the, the notion of, the, of Jung's unconscious. He kind of takes Jung's concept of the unconscious and reveals it positively as this uh, arena or agon that, that formulates problems, which then in virtue of this formulation creates these vectors by which difference is creatively produced. Um, then we get to James Hillman later on who, and perhaps even maybe around the same time as Deleuze, who looks at Jung's concept of individuation and is quite concerned about its monotheistic bent because it seems as if all of the images that one might encounter in a dream, in a daydream, or in a fantasy tend towards buttressing this unified notion of a self with a capital S. And it's interesting, Grant, that you point out that Deleuze takes self with a capital S and uses that as a concept in difference in repetition. But Hillman's critique is this. He's like, look, if we're going to talk about individuation, we have to talk about the individuation of the concept of individuation itself, that there is not one singular individuation, but a multiplicity of individuations. This is something that we look at in our book. And um, I, I was wondering, Grant, you know, since your book is called Integration, Indifference, I, I mean, the, the, the totality or the, the whole of your research seems to take this problem head on. And I was curious, 
where do you come down or which side do you come down upon? Are you more on the Jungian side of this sort of like holistic monotheistic integration or, or perhaps are you with Deleuze, you know, and, and Hillman in saying that maybe there's a more polytheist, polytheistic, a more perverse kind of individuation, or even Hillman says something to the effect of like, look, there are going to be some individuations of some particular lives that aren't really palatable, very unsavory in the end. But the destiny of a particular life was such that maybe it appeared tragic, but that was the culmination of that particular life. So my question is, how do we utilize this concept of individuation to, to discuss the multiplicity of lives? Um, maybe there's something there that you can grab onto. Yeah, I mean, so I think that's why I'm so drawn to Mysterium Conjunctionis, which is, you know, after Aeon, which is specifically about, about the Christ archetype, um, that sort of, you know, monotheistic, you know, um, monocentric archetype, it's, which Jung, Jung says is, it's, it's, you know, the, and, and Deleuze and Guattari also say this, it's the, the sort of the biunifical um, mirroring of God and the ego, that, that, that they're in, intimately related, they're two sides of the same coin. Um, and so that, and so, so the overcoming of the exclusive dominance of ego is also, um, is also the overcoming of the exclusive, exclusively monotheist mode of consciousness. And so, in Mysterium Conjunctionis, it's it's about um, alchemy. And the and the alchemists, I think, you know, this is what Jung says that they were sincerely believing Christians, but they also engaged really deeply with um, polytheism, and. And so, I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily an either or that I think that, but I think where, where you get into trouble is this, it, where a lot of people get into trouble is asserting um, the one as, you know, exclusively dominant. It's the absolute, it's the, you know, the monotheistic divinity at the expense of all other divinities. And Deleuze has that great quote in uh, the Nietzschean philosophy where he says, the gods have died, but they've died um, from laughing on hearing the one God claim to be the only one. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more on the side of polytheism. Uh, and I, I just, I think it's a more, you know, I think that, that, uh, monotheism is, is deeply bound up with, um, with capitalism and with, um, the exclusive, you know, logocentric, that, that Der Deridian term, um, logocentric rationality, um, and, as as these uh, privileged, you know, exclusively privileged um, modes of of relation to experience, and so I think that that thinking in terms of polytheism is is much more generative. But um, you know, I, 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 you don't want to get too too holy about it. I, it's you know, I mean, these are these are. Um, that's what I love so much about Hillman is that he's really irreverent. I mean, he he said, you know, he says that it's it's that often, you know, there's there's that great quote where he says um, that you know, for, for the Christians are always told that that God loves you, and you know, maybe there's some truth in that, but but for the gods of polytheism his sense is that they don't really care one way or another about you and they demand your submission and <laughs> you know and and uh and so 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 it's it's generative to think in terms of of these you know polytheistic divinities and not not only hellenic that just happens to be the the the, the greek gods that just happens to be the the tradition that most of these thinkers are operating in um but uh, you know so um does that sort of answer your question? It does. It does. Thank you. In fact, uh, we'll, we'll move towards closing out the, the live stream. Just want to thank you again for coming on. I, I mean, we're getting a lot of comments here saying that people got a lot out of this. I'll just flag some of them up again. Hey, y'all, I'm a classically trained chef. I love uh, playing with the concept of potency for a long time. Love this. Uh, Jay Lang says potency as ingredients in a fridge is a really nice analogy. So that's a shout out to Keanu. Uh, a lot. Uh, I'm new to a lot of these authors and ideas, but I'm getting a ton out of this discussion. So that's great. Of course, from Benjamin, we got the fire comment. And uh, actually, we'll take one question, too, from the folks who are listening. And then after that, maybe we'll give it to Keanu and Adam will wrap us up. So here, here's a question. Maybe we can throw this on the table. Um, is 
the death drive a potency or how does it figure into the Jung Deleuze connection? I think Deleuze did not like the death drive as an explanatory device, which that is true. And maybe even to a certain extent, Jung did not like it as well. What, what do you think, Grant? Uh, doesn't, doesn't he say that, 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 that Thanatos is repetition? I mean, that's right. Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, I, I think he. I think he, this is what Deleuze was struggling with. I think he's struggling with the negative, um, and I think um, that you know the, the Hegelian negative sort of embodied that figure for him. But it's also, um, I think, at a deep. He, he says, you know, um, but repetition. It's it's a voyage um, to the bottom of repetition. It's it's it's. I mean, he he evokes Tartarus, which is the domain of. Of Kronos, it's the domain of you know that that Saturnine um, father who devours his progeny, um, and and so um, I, yeah, I, I mean I, I think I think he was you know like like we were saying I think he was simultaneously trying to escape escape the death drive but also affirming it. I mean it's like you know nothing with Deleuze is ever is ever simple. It's all, it's he's and and I think that's why people love him so much is that you know I, I think of him almost as like a like a like a coquette, like a philosophical coquette, you know. Mm. He's he's always he's like flirting with all these different modes modes of interpretation and and modes of thought and drawing you know sort of um admiring and bemused readers into his web and then and then unsettling them and saying some, you know, going off in a different direction and not letting us rest in these sort of, um, you know, sort of fixed systematizing conceptual constructions, but always op opening his constructions, op um, con constructions up to, to, to difference and to revision. Um, so, you know, I think that's why we're, that's part of why we're still talking about him. Yeah, I mean, this is just a, a riff on on your comment, and then the and then the question here as well. I think the archetype of Thanatos, which could, uh, you know, have some overlap with some other archetypal figures. Right now, for me, the, the figure of the devil in the in the tarot is is coming up. Even though I know there is a figure of death as well, but the idea of repetition um, and Thanatos as a kind of repetition, I think, has a, as its base or at least a sort of adjunct concept is, is a notion of self-preservation and the way that certain repetitions. And this is one of the things that Hillman actually notices in his book on aging called The, the Force of Character, uh, where he talks about the way in which, for example, older people will repeat stories about themselves. And it's not to get the information out there, and it's not because you haven't heard it before, but that, the, that particular rep repetition is an affirmation of the singularity of that particular person at that stage of life. And there's another way in which certain repetitions, like addiction, for example, you know, that are ordinarily associated with the de death drive, you know, can have this kind of grip on you to, to the extent that it excludes other potencies. And this is the, this is the real risk with, with addiction is, I mean, of course is death, but um, what it does, what it ends up doing is, is precluding the richness of the multiplicity of our experience as well. So there, to me, there's a lot of functions happening there. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Grant. Um, so, so I, I think my, my last or uh, <laughs> one one more thought would be that um, I think there are different inflections of the death drive, and one inflection of the death drive is just mere closure. It's just an ending, um, and I think that's what Derrida expresses so brilliantly. Um, is the closure of an epoch. But I think Deleuze tends to focus more on the Dionysian mm. inflection of death, which is a death and rebirth. It's, mm. uh, and you know, he talks about this as early as uh, that great piece, Desert Islands from the 50s. Um, and it's that, that the, and, and Hillman talks about this in Suicide and the Soul, um, that, that the drive toward suicide is a literalization of, the need to undergo an ego death in order to be reborn in not as a qualitatively different person, but 
but to dissolve the ego and resituate the ego in a more, um, you know, a more plural and decentered multiplicity of of imaginal figures, because that's, I mean, that's sort of like the fundamental idea of depth psychology is that we have a lot of different persons in our psyche. And so we don't, so the idea is to sort of overthrow this totalitarian egoic dictator and create a more democratic uh, multiplicity, um, which I think, you know, also is ex extendable to, um, to the, the uh, overturning of capitalism in favor of something a little bit more uh, <laughs> more pluralist and life affirming. Keanu, you had an interesting comment in our private chat here. Maybe yes. You could yes. So this question of the drive goes back to beyond a pleasure principle, which Derrida has basically kind of like played around with and looked at. And there's this group of people publishing called the Free Energy Principle who draw on beyond the pleasure principle and Derrida's reading these kinds of things. Um, and so I think that this kind of goes into their sort of mathematical construction of how things work. But um, yeah, let me go back to my comment real quick. So yes, the manifold, construction of the manifold. Like there, we talked about habits, we talked about bringing things in. It's like, if you imagine yourself as a network, it's like a new drive is a new node. Every time you return to it, it's like you're strengthening that connection. Um, and so it's like it folds into the graph and it kind of grows the graph of the manifold over time. It's kind of how I like imagined this. So like when I when I saw that question about the drive, I was like, actually, there's something like particular about the drive that's found its way. It's been re-expressed by other people. And I've seen this idea play with a lot. I think mean, it's, it's very interesting. Um, there's yeah, that, I guess that's really what I had to say is there's a lot to beyond the pleasure principle in the way that it figures into the creation of folds, the creation of habits and all these other things. No, that, that's that's great, Keanu. It reminds me of Adam's talk about Kant all the time on, on the show. There's actually two more comments I'd like to flag up quick, and maybe Adam can hit this one. Uh, it's from a Reflective Journey. They say, I am currently going through science of logic. Hegel defines positive and negative in terms of each other and both return to the ground in logic of essence. I'm not familiar with the negative in Deleuze. Is there a way to sort of parse those differences? Mm, for, the, for this, really, you need to turn to a text like Nietzsche and philosophy or um, difference repetition, because Deleuze's interaction with Hegel is almost entirely filtered through that of his teacher at the time as he was writing difference repetition, which was his thesis, which was Jean Hippolyte, who famously wrote Genesis and Structure of Hegel's Phenology of Spirit, and also a book on the logic whose name currently escapes me. I mean, I said you already you would have a graph of Hegel here, but it does negative in Deleuze. I mean, it, it does sense, sometimes it does seem to be that the negative for Deleuze is always portrayed as, uh, for example, he says that contradiction, and he says in different traditions that contradiction is different seen sort of from below. It is a reactive or retrospective look at, the, well, at, at sort of the things that keep logic moving that actually produces difference but it doesn't actually give differences its full power. For, for Deleuze, I mean, Deleuze's problem with Hegel is that Hegel, he says, presupposes identity in order so that difference can come out of it through contradiction, and then he can unify it again. So the way I always explain Hegelian dialectics, I'm just using this to give a general overview, and then go to Deleuze is through the magnet. We actually have a short episode on this called Concepts in Focus. We talk about the magnet here example you try and have the identity you know you identify the positive pole can't really do that what's the positive pole only makes it immediately just completely unstable you cut a magnet in half you get two magnets and that is because the identity of the positive or the negative pole is an identity constructed through the different the difference and the relation between a positive and negative pole they're only constituted in their identity as either you know, the identity of the positive pole or the identity of the negative pole through that mutual interaction. Now, Marx is going to show up eventually and say, yeah, but who the fuck made that magnet? That's, that's the real question. But regarding Deleuze's critique of the negative, it's ultimately going to be that negation doesn't produce difference insofar as the precept, the ordering is wrong. So for Hegel, identity is, identity is first, it's unstable, and that's why it produces its own negation. 
and therefore there needs to be a negation of the negation to return a meta stability to the identity or rather a stability which moves through its other um, and this moves through contradiction whereas Deleuze is going to have a similar view which is that but fundamentally has a, a, a different pun intended presupposition which is that difference is first and the identity is essentially a metastable um, aspect of of difference or a, a looping of difference very similar to how for example I mean, think about we are sitting on a planet which has regular periods of 365 and a bit days and we call it a year so by that by that periodization it makes it seem like so a year from now our planet will be in the same position as it is it's not because even it's in the same position around the sun yes but the solar system is moving okay maybe it's the same position throughout the galaxy well the galaxy is moving Maybe it's the same position through the cluster of galaxies. The, galax the galaxy clusters are moving. Maybe it's the same position relative to the rate of expansion of the universe. That rate is accelerating. That's why we have things like dark matter. So the stability of any category which we can identify in thought, in experience, is going to be produced by a essentially an imminent flow underneath that. Whereas for Hegel, it's, it's fundamentally structured around identity, at least in how Deleuze reads it. I think maybe you can summarize the distinction between the two, particularly when it comes to ideas like the subject, the self, in, uh, in, in these two ways. For Hegel, the production of reality and the reality of our experience of that reality is structured like a subject. And therefore, we go back to a logic of the subject. This is a classic German idealist move. But for Deleuze, and I think he's more emphasizing that actually it's the other way around, the production of experience, the production of sense, the production of reality is a process in which the subject is another production. The production, the subject is structured like the production of reality. And therefore the model we have for identity, identification, the I equals I, is actually a product of a fast more a vastly more differentiated process multiplicities where there may be a kind of oneness but it's not a capital o oneness where things are closed off from anything else rather there are habits pools uh, rhythms repetitions which presuppose that difference in the same way that the position of the earth around the sun presupposes that difference because it's grounded on that it just happens in these circular rep repetitional uh, patterns. I think that's one of the ways we can distinguish the two. If, if I've completely got this wrong, someone please, please correct me. <laughs> no, that's great. Reflective Journey says that makes sense. I will chew on that. And we have maybe about two minutes left. Let's see if we can handle just one last question and then we'll close it out. Uh, Abdullah AC says, writes, Deleuze was known for his engagement with Nietzsche's philosophy, Jung too. Can you speak on the Nietzschean influence of both author, authors? Uh, first, let me say this. We're going to do the Deleuze and Nietzsche reading group on our Patreon starting this month. So that would certainly be a place to uh, have that question answered on a regular basis for the next six months or months or so. Uh, Grant, do you want to say anything about that before we close out? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Nietzsche was deeply influential on both Jung and Deleuze. Um, and, you know, I think, so one, one thing, I think, one reason Deleuze was so, you know, that Nietzsche might be Deleuze's primary influence. I mean, also Spinoza and Bergson, but I think it, it, it's because Nietzsche always was always transgressing, transgressing and pushing beyond systematizing enclosures and trying to use the language of of philosophy um, to go to go beyond what had previously been expressed um, and so you know I, I mean I he Deleuze picks up on so many of Nietzsche's concepts um, and I think often it, deeply in resonance with Jung who also was picking up on a lot on a lot of Nietzsche's concepts even though that hasn't been discussed much, um, you know. For instance, the the concept of the eternal return, which um, Nietzsche only talks about a couple times, and in sort of this very, you know, sort of ambiguous and evocative way. And then, but it, that enables 
Deleuze to formulate um, a much more um, fully elaborated theory of the eternal return, which is basically what we've been what we've been talking about for the majority of this uh, this meeting. Um, you know, which is which is the 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 repetitious um, engagement with with dynamic potent complexes, um, and so so I you know I I think that that you know Nietzsche is sort of like the godfather of this <laughs> this trajectory of thought, um, and of course you know of course he had his his own influences. I mean he says when he read Spinoza for the first time, he he, he wrote to a, a friend, he said, I have a precursor, I finally found my precursor in Spinoza. So, uh, but, so, uh, you know, I, I think, I think all of these figures um, form this sort of like multivalent um, lineage um, that's, but, but it, gets, it can't be just sort of, uh, reduced to one one singular line but but they're all sort of working on a similar project in the same direction and that's why i think it's what we're doing all doing collectively is so um important bringing jung back into this conversation um because i i think jung has been you know sort of unfairly um uh, not discussed as much in in the academy and sort of maligned um just specifically because um uh, because he his work is not he's his work isn't based on the privileging of rationality and materialism and so freud has been much more you know much more dominant in the humanities and i, I think that's something that um this engagement with um deleuze's jungianism could really serve to to shift especially in in relation with with hillman who uh, you know i i think craig probably agrees with me as the the most interesting um, post-Jungian thinker. I do. And Grant, I, I just want to thank you. It's been an hour and a half plus uh, for devoting your time to this live stream here today. Keanu, too, uh, coming on the show. We'll definitely have to have you back. And Kike, who left us to go uh, do some work with one of his clients. And, and of course, Adam, too. So just want to thank all of the listeners again. Uh, we will repost this on our stream sometime over the next uh, we will repost this on our podcast feeds sometime over the next week or two weeks or thereabouts. And I just want to say thanks again to Grant and Keanu for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. That's been great. I love the conversation. Hey, thanks coming back. Mm -hmm.